Stas in the past, the time in overdrive, and be what's on your mind. Bury wounds in the feelings, inexplicable the lies. And I wish that I could find all the truth. I could take on the whole. Well, hello, ALBW, wherever you are. It's good to be back, and I hope your summers are going swimmingly. Happy to say, but they move too fast, don't they? So um, some of the wonderful things that have happened with Gentleman Jack is the outpouring of interest in any number of areas, and especially in art and history. Today's guest um, combines both of those things, 
really fascinating uh, person with a really fascinating project going on. And before we get started, we're going to run a short video that gives you an indication about how Carol goes about her work in creating a graphic novel. So without further ado, take it away, Steph. Well, I don't know about you, but every time I watch it, this is me. Well, that's playing. Wow. <laughs> so, so let's bring Carol on. Hello. Hi, Carol. How are you? Hi, Pat. I'm great. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's an honor oh, to be here. Such Thank a you. pleasure to have you. I, I am just fascinated by the work that you're doing on, <laughs> on both levels. I mean, the, uh, the process by which you create these things is just fantastic fascinating to me. And then, of course, the work that you're doing uh, behind the scenes on the story itself is equally fascinating. So uh, um, there's a couple of things that I want to hit right off the top before we dive down into it. Uh, first of all, tell me a little bit about how your interest in Eliza Rain started. Um, well, actually, it started in the 90s when I was a student and um, I studied Russian. Uh, and I... Um, my flatmate actually her mother knew Hel helena whitbread wow. and um so because of my flat my flatmate was also studying russian with me and i think helena asked uh, my friend if if she would help her out um when she was looking at the the story of anne and anne walker going to the caucasus in case there were any particular russian connections or russian translations that needed to be done so in fact, I asked my friend lately what had happened, and she said nothing. <laughs> nothing ever came of that. However, yeah. when I was I was a you know young woman and um, questioning my own sexuality, and my ears pricked up at the story of Anne, yeah. uh, the two Annes, and then I changed career. So I was a Russian lecturer for some years, and then I changed career about ten years ago and became an artist and a writer, and. You know, and I then carried on specializing in graphic novels, bringing in my research and so on. And then Gentleman Jack hit the screens and like everybody, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I remembered the story of Anne in, um, in Russia and I took myself off to Calderdale to read Phyllis Ramsden's book um, or yes. manuscript. And, um, and it was actually there that I came across the story of Eliza. I hadn't known about it. And, and largely actually thanks to Patricia Hughes's book, which obviously, you know, was the first to to kind of 
well, as far as I'm aware, to break that ground. Yes. Yeah, so that's how I ended up here. So um, with all with all kudos to Patricia for what she's done with uh, Eliza Rain to date and continues mm -hmm. to do, by the way, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. have uh, started to do a lot of your own research in kind of digging further down into the story. And one of the yeah. things that you... Um, mentioned to me early on in our pre-chat was there's, there is a lot of speculation to this work I, because mm -hmm. it is research and, and as everybody mm -hmm. else trying to find their way into mm -hmm. Ann Lister and Ann Walker have the same challenges. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, um, what you're finding in yeah. terms of that. Okay, well, I think, I think as you might, may have gathered from the little video um, and the snippet about the pistols and so on, um, the, but one of the points I'm trying to make with my work is, is about how we tell history. So I'm aware that they are false stories, effectively. Um, and, and the point I'm trying to make is, is, is effectively, yeah, how, how we sort of struggle our way towards these stories with um, varied sources. And I'm with Eliza, um, and indeed I'm, I'm you know, very grateful to Patricia for her, her, her work. Um, and I'm also trying to bring in other sources. So I've been looking at some of the history, the background of um, of the East India Company, for instance, of of Eliza and uh, and her family's early life in in British uh, India, as it was at that time. Right. So effectively, I'm trying to triangulate a bit, try and find a step aside from Anne Lister as well a bit. Obviously, she's our main source for so much of this material. But I'm I'm. Yeah, trying to sort of uh, take a creative, but also a, a, a sort of a research active approach to finding new sources. Right, and I, mm -hmm. as we get further into the novel itself and some of the images that we're gonna be sharing with you today, um, you've taken a really interesting approach to Ann Lister that we'll, we'll get to uh, yeah. as the crow. Uh, it, yeah. it's, it's all just fascinating. Um, but so one of the points that you made with me is that um, when we study Ann Lister and the people around her, mostly what we find is Anne's point of view on everything because mm -hmm. we have her point of view on literally everything for you mm -hmm. know many years of her life. Mm -hmm. but we don't have a lot of information about the other people that are involved in her story. Yeah, yeah, that's well, th that's that's right. So I mean, I think I've I've come up with various. Um, you know, I've been looking at various characters or various people in her story, um, you know, which I'm happy to talk about. But, um, you know, Lady Crawford, her sister Jane, um, Miss Marsh in particular, the Duffins, right. Captain Alexander and so on as well. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that where I really started was with that historical context um, in Madras. So I've been looking at her early life in um, Chennai, well, what's now Chennai and what was then Madras. And I'm thinking of, I've been doing quite a lot of work in the East India Company because they documented themselves so well. So yeah. as I'm sure people know, just a little potted history is that it was a, a private company that operated in India um, until, uh, well, it became an arm of the state, of the British state in about the 1820s. Hmm. But before that, it was private. Um, so there was no kind of war between Britain and India, but there were multiple conflicts. There was a kind of shifting patchwork of allegiances throughout the subcontinent that were effectively proxy wars for a conflict between France and, and Britain oh. that then, then developed into the Napoleonic Wars later on as well. And both um, and Eliza's family and different members of it were caught up in these conflicts. So her father, who was a, a head surgeon in um, in in Madras, he was caught up in the second Anglo-Mysore War, as it was called. So that was between 1780 and 1784. And he was captured, and I'll talk a bit more about that a bit later on. Um, but Jane, and Jane too, her sister was caught up in this, in effectively an extension of the Napoleonic Wars, when she returned from India after her failed marriage to Henry Bolton. And right. she returned and she was captured um, well, her, the ship she was on was captured and they were held in what's now Mauritius, the Ile de France, as it was called then. So part of this was to try to, I was trying to work out what was Madras like for Jane, uh, for Eliza, well, and Jane as well. Right. <clears throat> and, and actually, although it had this kind of very contested history, after about 1769, there was a treaty. There was a treaty which protected Madras, more or less. 
So it was not, um, there were conflicts all over the place, but Madras itself uh, and where, where Eliza was born and raised um, was a very nice area. It seemed a nice, from, from what I've read. So she lived in a place called Vepery, which was an, an elite suburb for the mm -hmm. British. It was mm -hmm. west of town. Mm -hmm. um, I know, well, I, I, I deduce that it was a kind of a nice place to live because I've gone through the Madras Courier and there they advertised many um, auctions and houses for rent and so on, including um, in, in the same area, including one called Myrtle Grove that was at that point described as inhabited by Dr. Rain. So, oh, you know, wow. he lived there. Yeah. So, um, so, so in a way it was, um, you know, I mean, it was a fortified city, of course. There was a lot of, you know, it was, in fact, that area was surrounded by a uh, uh, impenetrable hedge <laughs> as a fortification but um, and there was a lot of building work going on as well there was a lot of kind of all the institutions of state were being built and established then so again I'll, I can come back to that um, and I was also sorry go on oh no so what I was going to say is that all of this is important because it fills in some of the questions about uh, the relationship that William Rain had to his daughters, how they were taken care of, where they kind of sat in the yeah in That's society, it. correct? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, now as I understand it, um, so the children, uh, mixed race children from British uh, Indian um, relationships were not uncommon. Mm -hmm. Many East Indian officer, East India Company officers had uh, married or lived with um, usually Muslim Indian women, um, not Hindu or very unlikely to be Hindu because uh, Westerners were considered to be beneath uh, the caste of untouchables in um, in the Hindu system, so um, which which was a source of major conflict as well in 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 uh, British Indian history. So um, it's likely that um, yeah that that that's where they sat in that 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 social system. Um, the status of children actually changed in the 1790s. There were these things called the Cornwallis reforms, where um, basically children before that had been had the right to be recognised legally as British British mm. Indian children. Mm. Um, they were sent, they were often sent back um, and they had free passage. Now, Eliza and Jane um, uh, kind of coincided with this, this change in the legislation where free passage no longer happened and they were no longer recognized legally as British. And this might explain Jane's difficulties, particularly when she was unable to apparently um, to, to demonstrate that she was British when she returned from India and mm -hmm. found herself caught up in this terrible situation. And it might also be pertinent for how we understand Eliza's later reception as well. So, you know, that's that's the, that background. Really important stuff. Um, mm. Now, so you're in the process of doing this, you're you're approaching the work both as a researcher and an artist. And part of what you're trying to do is find an interesting story to tell. Right. In terms yeah. of holding a graphic novel. Yeah. So we have to find, it's just like writing anything else. You have to find all the points of, of uh, conflict and, and develop a storyline and, and thing, right? Yeah. So one of the things that we've, that we've talked about um, is there are key relationships between every single one of the people that appear in your graphic novel, Analyzer Rain. But one of the things that I wanted to, it was a quote that you gave me in our pre-chat and I'd just like to read it off because I think it's perfect. Uh, okay. <laughs> as we as we read about Eliza Rain from Patricia Hughes or even in, in your situation or some of the other talks that we've had, um, she gets described in a variety of ways, but you described Eliza this way. In reading her letters, she comes across as a complex character, young, of course, so we need to bear this in mind. And in some ways, intemperate, clingy, needy, and angry. When you read about Eliza and Ann Lister, you can certainly take that point of view. But Eliza was also abandoned, ostracized, desperate, and damaged by trauma. She was simultaneously extraordinarily privileged and extraordinarily lost. And I think that that pretty much sums out up a lot of the sadness in her story. Mm -hmm. So 
you, you've told me that uh, you want to focus on the contradictions in her situation that inform the work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So let's start off with, let's just start by talking about some of the characters in her life and what you found out about them. And this is really where I want to diverge into what new things your work is bringing to the table. Okay. So first of all, there was Lady Crawford. Mm. And tell us a little bit about who Lady Crawford was to Eliza and Jane and how that all worked out. Sure. Okay. So Lady Crawford was uh, the niece of William Rain. So she's described as Eliza and Jane's cousin. Mm. Um, and um, she was appointed with William Duffin, um, William Rain's colleague. Uh, she was appointed the children's guardian and the executor of William Rain's will as well. Now, um, and you've just seen on your screen the, the will flash up. There is his will. And um, there is a little snippet that I've just put on there, which, as you can see, uh, he writes, um, my express direction is that Robert Crawford shall not in any wise interfere in my last will, uh, etc. as I have the worst opinion of his moral character. Mm. Now, um, this so this is the husband of Lady Crawford. Um, Patricia Hughes's book uh, tells us that they were divorced by this point and that the reason for their divorce was that he was uh, homosexual. Mm. Um, I'm, I haven't found the source myself for this, and um, I have been do, doing quite a lot of digging around on it. Um, but it clearly, we, or we, what we do have evidence of is, is of his, his vehement dislike of Crawford. Now, Lady Crawford takes in Eliza when she's expelled from school. So, Lady, uh, so Eliza's 17, I think, and she goes to live with her cousin uh, while Anne moves in with the Duffins and, and resumes her own schooling. And um, Lady Crawford and, and Eliza have a, well, Eliza has a terrible time there by her own account. Um, you know, she talks about Lady Crawford's sort of screaming abuse at her and then stonewalling her. And she hides uh, Anne's correspondence and parcels and so on. Yes. Um, and, all, and, uh, and, and part of the correspondence is also about Jane, uh, who is in difficulties in India as well. So this, that's all kind of starting to bubble up at the same time. Mm. Now, it could be a matter, that, you know, from that evidence that, in fact, you know, Lady Crawford, yeah, was um, homophobic, uh, and you know, she realised that something was going on. There was certainly some incident that happened when that Eliza sort of alludes to in her letters when Anne visits. Mm. Um, but the other factor to take in mind is that Jane had gone to live there earlier. The sister had gone to live there earlier as well, and had come back, um, and they had not got on either. Mm. So it not just that or I mean you know there are other factors going on they may of course be to do with race as well and personality I mean uh, that's the in, that's the thing that uh, intrigues me as an artist but is obviously um imponderable you know I can't I can't prove that at, at all um so yeah I've I've gone through down various rabbit holes with uh, Lady Crawford uh, uh merged again at Descent so yeah that's her right mm. and so and so just to um, to clarify a couple of things for our audience that uh, in terms of creating a story, creating a graphic novel, um, as you explore each of these different characters and how they relate to Eliza, they may or may not appear in your graphic novel. They may or may not have uh, mm -hmm. bigger points of conflict, et cetera, whatever keeps the story moving, but still keeps it true in a historical context. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to quickly remind those people who may be tuning in to one of our broadcasts for the first time, especially about Eliza Rain. Um, Eliza was at the Manor School with Ann Lister. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But when they were separated, when the two of them were separated at school, uh, basically one of them got to be at school at a time. And so Eliza mm -hmm. Rain continued on with her studies until she was expelled. Mm -hmm. And then Ann Lister was able to come back and continue her studies at the Manor School. So just in case anybody was wondering about that. Mm -hmm. um, the next character that certainly plays a huge part in Eliza's life is Jane. So let's right. chat a little bit about her. So, um, so Jane, who was two years older than Eliza, um, met a soldier, a young man, um, I believe on a trip to York, and um, 
his name was Henry Bolton, and announced that she was going to marry him and uh, did so against the wishes of uh, her guardians, that's Lady Crawford and William Duffin. Um, although they were there, we, we thanks to um, I think there are some people on the internet who've been doing sterling work, putting on, uh, you know, finding details about the, the documents about this. Um, we know that Eliza was there as a witness in the marriage uh, to the wedding rather, um, and, and so was Duffin. So, you know, they were they were there and supporting her in that way. Mm. Um, so they go to India, Jane and Henry. Um, but by 1809, um, she had been left by him and she was making her way back to Britain unaccompanied and pregnant. Um, so, yeah. well, hold on a second. Before we go yeah. any further, we also want to yeah. tell because again, there may be people here who aren't uh, familiar with this. Um, when, when William Duffin, in William Duffin's will, uh, he wanted to make sure that his daughters were well taken care of. And he left each of them uh, 4,000 uh, gold, or what are they called? Star pagodas? Star pagodas, yeah, star pagodas. Right, um, which works out to be a ton of money. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. A, a tidy sum. So William Rain, indeed, he makes, his his will is a very interesting document that you can get from the National Archives in, in uh, London. Hmm. Um, by the way, if anyone is interested in that. It's a long, a lengthy document and he takes great pains. He describes his loving daughters, you know, and he, he is he's very careful about what will become of them. Um, so yes, that's that's right. So Jane is like Anne, uh, sorry, like Eliza, she yeah. is effectively an heiress. And when she marries, upon marrying Henry Bolton, her money immediately goes to him he takes control of it legally. And that's a key, key issue because then what happens is that uh, Bolton leaves her or mm. abandons her. Mm. And she comes back, as I said, um, and Eliza is getting these letters and then she's writing to Anne at this time. And she, in her letters, refers to um, uh, Jane's criminal conduct. Well, she, at the same time, she's seeking to excuse it, but she uses that term, criminal mm. conduct. And she uses phrases like, she says, uh, depraved as she has been. Um, and um, she says something else. She's at one point says, do, um, she asks Anne if she thinks the letter might be an account of Jane's death. She's waiting for a letter. And she says, do you think it might be an account of Jane's death, though the release would perhaps be a blessing? Oh my gosh, um, wow. So, so this kind of speaks to the, the rather conflicted relationship that interests me. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to go back to this question of criminal conduct because I yes. think it's important that it's not actually her pregnancy that is at issue here. Criminal conduct referred to adultery. So this makes me, yeah, in law, it referred to adultery, not pregnancy, although you could say pregnancy is de facto evidence of adultery in certain circumstances. Wow. But Henry, I, I just had this, you know, a question. It's an open question. I don't know the answer, but is it possible, given Eliza's attitude to Jane, what she sort of hints, is that in fact he left her because she had had, had a liaison with somebody else, that she had been unfaithful to him? You yeah, know, would that be the, the criminal conduct that is being alluded to? Right. But also, I have asked myself why it was that his claim on her money, because he took all her money, wasn't contested by her former guardians. Why did they just abandon her? Now, legally, that was the case. He had absolute right to her money, but there, there seemed to have been no objection to this, I've found anyway. Right, wow. Um, and it also, I also have a question about why Eliza, well, she's obviously evidently conflicted about Jane, really conflicted about her. Yeah. Um, why Eliza didn't give her any money. So Jane comes back, 1809, I think, plus possibly 10. Yeah. There's a three or four year period between her turning up and then effectively going away again and then turning up again, desperate, and that's when the, the asylum question is, arises. Yeah. There's that period where Eliza, Eliza doesn't give, doesn't appear to give Jane any money or ask for her, any money to be put her way. And Jane becomes, according again to Hughes's book, but I think there are other, um, other evidence of this in her letters, but Jane becomes destitute and a prostitute and or takes to the streets as, 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 I've, as I've understood it. Right. So there's that question of, you know, she was giving Anne money at that time. She didn't give her sister money at that time. I mean, she her, her access to her own money was limited, of course, mm -hmm. but where was the, uh, you know, 
where was the d debate about that? That's that's just an open question, but it's made me think again, just to go back to that question of who is Eliza? She's a, you know, a complicated character, I think. Yes, and and I, I agree with the, you <clears throat> with the fact that the fact that she hasn't uh, helped support Jane on her return. And obviously Jane is in a great deal of distress when she gets back to the UK. Mm -hmm. um, it is interesting and it, it, it's, uh, it looks like a really great avenue for creating drama, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, that's, there's yeah. another point of drama here that I, I realized I just skipped over in our outline here. And that is with um, Eliza Rain and a young soldier that she meets, Captain Alexander. Oh yeah, yeah, right. that's right. Yeah, and so, again, this is a yeah a complicated story, but absolutely, you're right. It, there's so much potential there um, in, in dramatic terms. Yeah. Um, so he, he, I believe he was related to the Alexanders, the the family that that turns up in Anne Lister's um, world as well, hmm. and he um, he effectively courts her. And it sounds as though she was she liked him, you know, well enough to be to have a friendship with him. Right now, and then it all went sour, and effectively he um, he was told by her that he she w wouldn't marry him or wasn't interested in marrying him. <coughs> Excuse me. And he then um, he then uh, I think what then happened was that uh, this story went right around Halifax society, and she was ostracized. I mean, severely punished socially for this excuse right. me i just needed some water here yeah now i just again want to just clarify that this was not un or unlikely to have been a breach of promise situation breach of promise was a situation that almost always applied to men and not to women so um <coughs> men breaking their promise to marry right for instance right but um, women in law were allowed to change their minds, being the weaker sex. That was the legal situation. I mean, it's not okay. a great situation, but that was the case. Right. <coughs> so Eliza was not actually the subject of a breach of promise suit or, um, you know, this is not, I think, the best way of interpreting it. OK. All right. So, sorry, so, I'm, I'm just going to cough for a moment while uh, you. Yes, go ahead. I'll fill in for you. So <laughs> meanwhile. So uh, the people in Halifax who have been um, open enough to accepting Eliza as sort of part of the town, as she spends time with, uh, as we know, with the Listers, mm -hmm. uh, she becomes part of that family sort of on the <laughs> side. And, mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, the town of Halifax certainly takes its sweet time in deciding whether or not she's a good person or not. And when she turns down Captain Alexander, then it shows something That's bad it. about her character, right? Mm -hmm. That's it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, now you had also said here, it's not breach of promise. Uh, mm -hmm. There was no evidence of promise on <laughs> marriage on Eliza's part. Mm -hmm. And then we come down to the question of so why did Mr. Duffin tell Alexander that he could not marry Eliza Rain? Like, mm. what is behind mm. that? Is it not a suitable match? Well, that's the curious thing. Eliza had just inherited her money at that point. So yeah. you'd think that, in effect, Duffin would be wanting her to get married, to find somebody. Um, but it was Duffin's intervention here that was, it was a curious matter to me. I don't, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Right. But more, right. but it speaks to that more general point I was making about both Jane and Eliza, about them being unprotected. Yes. And this, this word unprotected, we kind of, it doesn't resonate for us today as it did then. It was, it, you know, if you're reading the accounts of that time, look out for that word. It's, it means something quite different. It meant for, for, for young women, that they had to be chaperoned. They had they couldn't be in the presence of a man. Mm. Say invite a man in for for tea or whatever, without, an, you know, an invitation or without other people there. And that because that then could lead to, um, you know, the, the whole kind of issues of breach of promise or you know these sort of uh, matters or, um, basically could destroy a woman's reputation. Right. And I think that's really that's the question for me. I mean, Eliza. So when we were talking initially about the contradictions in her. She, for me, really tried to live on the very edge of what was permissible at that time, what was possible. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so interesting. Like when she went and set herself up on her own 
I mean, obviously with servants and so on, but she tried to go and set herself up as an independent woman in a way that I kind of recognize myself as a, you know, a woman of the 21st century. It's, right. It, she went, she she got rooms and she, she you know, tried to live in that way. Now, yes. but that le left her wide open to this accusation, to basically being unprotected. Right. So she had... So sexual propriety is the is a really huge issue here. For, yes. For, or the kind of perception of it for for how to understand what happened to Eliza, um, as well as as I say these other compound issues of race and um, you know and personality as well. But I think that's a really big issue that she was seen to have kind of breached um, the way in which women were meant to conduct themselves. I mean, Anne did too, but that's really interesting. You compared them, but who which one of them was punished? And which right. one of them actually had a, you know, really <laughs> a, which one a had, interesting life? Which one had <clears throat> the darker skin? Which one had the darker skin? I mean, uh, that, that yeah. of course. That, yeah. I mean, we, I could talk about that a little bit now, Pat, the, the yeah. issue of race, actually. And, and just to say that, again, I think when we talk about racism today, we're, we're obviously it's, you know, in, enormously important matter. And we are used to talking about it in terms of institutional, structural racism. Mm -hmm. And I think what is happening at this time, actually, is not structural racism per se, because <clears throat> if it were 40 years later, um, I think that would be the case, because that's that's the point where the East India Company and the British government really kind of um, put barriers up to Indian people mm -hmm. um, taking part in the company, assuming the same rights as British people, etc. Right. But at this time, when Eliza and Jane have come over, they are such a rarity. I mean, it, I mean there were British Indian children coming over, but still, I mean, I think there's a, there's a book by Francis Singh, uh, which I'll talk about you know, talk about later, but um, yeah. it, it, it's uh, she. She says something like 150 children came over over that kind of I don't know this sort of in the late 1790s, right? Early 1800s. <clears throat> so Eliza talks of uh, people staring at her, right? Um, you know, and that could be because I mean, obviously she was very she was beautiful, she was attractive. That's kind of something that comes through. But also, it could be that she was just, you know, it's that kind of exotic, in quotation marks, perception yeah. of her as well. So we do know that Miss Marsh, for instance, you know, I'm not, I'm not at all discounting individual and, you know, that there were very racist comments made about her. We right. know Miss Marsh, she wrote vile things about, you know, Eliza's black blood and the black progeny and her black heart and so on. But I'm just talking about this kind of structural racism that um, I think is not quite consolidated at this you know, point. There's something else that I wanted to bring up that we haven't really talked too much about. Um, yeah. And that's the other thing about Eliza Rain that we do know from a variety of different perspectives is that she was a very intelligent woman. Yes, that's she right. Had interest in science, interest in yeah. math. We've had Absolutely. the discussion about the possibility that it was really Eliza that introduced the, the code that Ann Lister then that's it kept building well, her own thing, right? Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. the, to go back to the code, um, that was this is just a theory of mine. Um, and I'll come back to the issue of Eliza and science, but um, yeah. her father, when he was um, captured in the second Anglo Mysore War, um, and this was a, a major sort of defeat for East India Company forces. Basically, many were captured, 300 odd killed. Um, mm. And he was taken prisoner and held in a, a fortress in Bangalore. Mm. And at that point, he happened to, he treated the, the son of the fortress commander, who then, and the son, son's life was saved. And then uh, Rain became a kind of key figure in brokering supplies, food, medicine, wow. medicine, etc but for the soldiers who were captured there and, you know, the village around. So right. he, that's that's how Rain worked. And that's well, rather that's how he kind of came to be head surgeon when, when he was released and, and so on. Right. The important bit about that, how this relates to Eliza's story, is that um, in Madras, there are lots of first-hand accounts of, of life in Madras that involved an extensive network of people basically sending each other little notes, little tiny, they're called chits, 
C-H-I-T-S. So these little chits went all over the place. You know, it's the equivalent of email today or text or WhatsApp or whatever. They would, you know, you'd just be sending messages. So it was right. a very kind of, it was a writing-based society. And when Rain was captured, um, the other thing that happened is that, that men, the men, the captured men used code and used um, little tiny scraps of paper to mm. send messages out. And these were, con again, constantly circulating in the same sort of manner. So, the, I mean... What I speculate, and again, just this is speculative, I don't have right. no proof of this, yeah. is that I imagine um, a, a sort of elderly father at this point, Rain was quite old when he had Jane and Eliza, right. um, with possibly failing eyesight, you know, showing uh, his daughter this little bit of code or scraps of paper that perhaps he still had, right. or that, you know, or that generally, as I say, more generally, that this kind of idea of, of writing in this way um, was was part of Madras life as well. So you know, yeah, there's that. And you can you can really I mean as a novelist, uh, you yeah. can really take that anywhere. It could be yeah. it could be uh, William Rain showing the code to his daughters to let them know that if they ever need to communicate in some fashion, et cetera, that there's a this is a way that he had done it in the past when he was in danger, yeah. right? Because yeah. he's getting ready to send his daughters over to to England. Well, yeah, I, I do have uh, actually just on that point. Um, I've got just to go back to Francis Singh's book, if I may, on the um, question Absolutely. of them them going over to England. Um, I've got there are two accounts um, here of um, which ships they went on. If uh -huh. anybody is interested on that, so in that, um, so um, this is uh, yeah. What you see on your screen now is actually the passenger list. This is courtesy of Francis Singh the author of a book I mentioned earlier, it's called Scandal and Survival in 19th Century Scotland. And it's about British Indi Indian, ch uh, uh, well, a child who came over and um, was involved in a very famous case about two Scottish school, school teachers, two women. Uh, she accused them of lesbianism uh, in the parlance of the time. And it was a scandal of the time. Um, but Francis Singh uh, mentions Jane and, and Eliza and William coming over and she says she has the passenger lists for them. Now, this is the passenger list for the Asia. That This is the ship that William Rain travelled on. Okay. And it in this, you can't really see it, I'm sure, on your screens, but at the very bottom or near the bottom, there is a mention of uh, somebody called J.N.O. Rain. J.N.O. stands for John or Jonathan. It was a common abbreviation. Um, and Francis Singh says uh, that this is Rain's son. I got hugely excited at this point, uh, ran off down so many rabbit holes. Yeah. In fact, it turns out that it is not <laughs> not his son, but his native servant. Um, but again, a very interesting figure for me to sort of pursue in my work because I'm looking for somebody who can stand outside and sort of cross over between these different groups as well. Right. Anyway, um, but I was actually just about to say about Jane and Eliza. Singh says that Jane and Eliza travelled in 1798 on the King George unaccompanied to William Duffin. Mm. And Patricia Hughes says that they travelled in 1801. So we have two contradictory accounts there, 1798 mm. or 1801. I need to find the passenger lists. That's the. I think that's where the truth of this will, or the kind of, you know, exactly. where we'll get some clarity here. Right. But the point, the kind of emotional point of this is that um, William Rain, if they did travel earlier, he didn't leave them behind. He went to join them. When he was traveling, he went to join them, if, right. if that's indeed the case. Yes. Um, and that, you know, so that kind of puts, a, again, a different slant. And it fits with my mind a little bit more with this idea of him being a kind of quite a loving man. Yes. In his, or careful anyway in his relationship to his children. Yes. Um, it's it's not born out later. But, I mean, by the way, Jane tears up his portrait, tears it into shreds later on, oh, wow. <laughs> which is another matter altogether. So, so oh, wow. I mean, you know, it's complicated, is I suppose the short answer uh, yeah. to that. Hmm. Now, there's another person in here uh, who Eliza has a distinct relationship with, and that's Miss Marsh. Tell us a little bit about Miss Marsh. Yes. Miss Marsh, indeed. Mary Jane Marsh, known as Molly, Molly Marsh, hmm. 1771 to 1855. So she married Duffin in 1826. She was a fairly 
old by this time, uh, by the by the standards of the time, fifty, I think fifty three or so, fifty four. Yeah. Anyway, maths. Um, she was a very interesting figure in her own right. She was, I, she was the daughter of a Reverend Philemon Marsh in York, a vicar. And he married at least twice, possibly three times, but he had six children from the first two marriages. And mm. she was the fourth of those children. <clears throat> and what's really striking, again, for me as an artist, is that those siblings, the, the first family group and the second family group, they all had the same names. <laughs> so there were, th there were three names. One was Philemon, one was Matthew, and one was Mary. Oh so they, they were the names of the first three. And then the second family group comes along and they just do the same thing again. <laughs> and I have checked, I mean, I thought, well, are these the same people? I ha I'm, you know, I need, obviously somebody might come along and correct me on this and I'm, yeah. I'm, I welcome that, absolutely. But yeah. um, as I found a family tree that appears to show these two different family groups, so I'm really interested in her. I mean, she's she, uh, she comes across as a really horrible person, and then there's her sister as well, who's um, you know Eliza obviously doesn't like either. There's a lot of tension there. Mrs. Uh, Greenup is her her married name. Right. Anyway, but so, so she's a great unreliable narrator, actually. I mean, they're all unreliable narrators. But yes. all these people, <laughs> they're all unreliable narrators of their lives. Yes. But I like the fact that Miss Marsh is out on the edge, actually. Yeah. You know, she's on the edge of things. She was in. She was taken in. Uh, you know, employed by uh, Duffin, Mister and Missus Duffin, to be the governess of the young children, and stayed there. You know, and she has. Um, well, she doesn't come across well. Is is all I can say really about her. But that's great, great, yeah. great fodder for um, you know artistic. Absolutely, because um, she was she was hired to be the governess. She was living there while Missus Mart, the the real uh, Missus Duffin, that's uh, it. is he dying. That's and, it, yeah. Uh, and then mm. just stepped right into her shoes uh, once yeah. you Yeah. 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 And, and and we also have that sort of rather unsettling um, insight. It comes from Anne's diaries of um, her attempt, according to Anne, to effectively uh, draw Anne into a sort of freedom with her and Duffin. So this is kind of really, <laughs> this is really kind of a rather disturbing account of, of this. Um, I'm sorry, I missed this. Where did you? you find I, oh, this is in. I think it's in Patricia Hughes's book. Actually, no, I'll have to. I'll, I shall. Right I shall send it to you, Pat, afterwards. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's, <laughs> a, it's a it's a rather where Anne, who is by this time, I think she must be about twenty seven or twenty eight. Basically, yeah. she says that Miss Marsh attempts to French kiss her. As she puts it, and uh, and she pretends she pretends that uh, she doesn't understand what this is about, and that it makes her lips feel strange, you know, and her, you know, that's anyway, probably too much information there. But anyway, yeah. so it's a it's a Miss Marsh comes across. I mean, this is Anne's account. Let's not yeah. forget. So you know, yeah, pinches of salt all round everyone. But now, nonetheless, I think Miss Marsh is a is a really interesting figure, and so I'm sure she'll. She'll play well, a part in my work, and she gets even more interesting. And and um, we're gonna we're gonna move forward a little bit here because cool. we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Um, but as we move, do move forward, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with what goes on here, uh, Miss Marsh or now Mrs. Duffin is uh, a key part of why Eliza winds up in a in a an asylum. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Mm. I, I don't want to jump away too far from um, Francis Singh's book, mm. nor the people that were in it, nor the uh, what it wound mm. up being. And for those of you to whom her story, The Scottish Teacher, sounds familiar, yes, indeed, that's what uh, Lillian Hellman based her play The Children's Hour on, which, of mm. course, became a movie back in the 60s. And was the first thing I ever saw that made me start thinking about the fact that, oh, <laughs> perhaps I might be gay. No. So, uh, so I have a, a connection to that one. But in any case, um, the judges that were active in that trial uh, of the school teachers when that case went to court, um, Steph, I don't know if you got a chance to put that together, but uh, they had a very interesting thing to be said about sex with women. And here it is. <laughs> Equally imaginary with witchcraft, sorcery, or Connor, carnal copulation with the devil. That's how Lord Meadowbank thought about the possibility of women having sex together. 
not very high in his opinion. And Lord Hope said, as likely as thunder playing the tune of God Save the King. So that should give you a little bit of information about, you know, where lesbianism was in the whole time period that we were talking about here. Now, let's um, talk a little bit about um, at this time, for those of you who aren't familiar with this story, uh, Ann Lister is off having her very own life. But she's also writing to her wife, Eliza, and asking her wife to send her husband her money. And this happens on several different occasions going forward. Um, one of the biggest, most specific points was when Anne decided to go off to Bath with mm -hmm. the Belcoms, right? <clears throat> That's right. And, um, and she asks Eliza for money so that she can go enjoy herself with, guess who? Mariana, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And Eliza is now um, becoming more clear on what's going on in that situation. Mm. That's right. Right. And all of this begins to stir up even more anger on the part of Eliza in terms of Anne, in terms of what's happened with her life, in terms of her sister, who's now also in an asylum. Mm. Um, and so here's poor Eliza. And the next thing you know, especially Miss Marsh now, Mrs. Duffin is banging the drum for Eliza to be put in an asylum. But there was, there was a lot, there was a lot that um, fell into that. According to the notes that I have from what you and I talked about, here's Eliza who's actually undergone a lot of social embarrassment in how yeah, that's that's it. I mean, I think she's just suffered kind of compound losses in a way, and um, and what she's in a way, what I think what she's trying to do is to she has still has hopes of recovering her social position. So right. she's she's really, um, you know, she's suffered the the Captain Alexander affair where she's um, you know she was ostracized, and then of course the Halifax. Uh, yeah. ostracization and she fails to sell her furniture at auction she tries to sell it in order oh, to yes, fund right. her, her to get yeah. immediate funds I think to so she can go to Bath and be with Anne and the Norcliffs and the Belcoms so just sort of one humiliation after another really terrible and then she suffers the loss of Samuel Lister as well and I think that was a big loss you know yes. and the Lister family didn't invite her to the funeral either which must have been indescribably hurtful and this is on top of her early losses of her, you know, we could say her family, her mother, her father, her country, her yes. her guardians as well, who have sort of turned against her at this point. So she's, there's a very sad bit in one of her letters where she, I think Anne is writing and saying, you know, one of her rare occasions when she did write at this time, saying something about the people she's been seeing and who's been visiting her. And Eliza responds and says, well, my visitors are, you know, the table lamp and um, the, the armchair and the, you know, the, the curtain hangings and so on. So she just, it's, it's, it's really painful. Yeah. So, yeah, I think absolutely at this point, Eliza is in a critical position. We're talking about, it's about 1814 now. So this is the point where Anne has resumed her affair with Mariana Belcom, as I understand it. And I think she's also started something with her sister, with Mariana Belcom's sister, Nance, as yes. well. Yes. And then that kind of was, was a public sort of some sort of breakdown of relations there. And it's around this time when Eliza has a first breakdown. I mean, I don't know really what form it took. I mean, there's Miss Marsh gives accounts of, you know, how upset at, at, uh, Eliza is in a, you know, in a deeply unsympathetic way, she recounts this. And um, so there's a series of breakdowns and then that she's permanently committed in April or May of 1816. And right. there's a, kind of, it's a bit hazy about what happens, or I'm a bit hazy, I should say, not it, but I am, um, right. about what happens in between. But there are moments where Eliza appears to, is asked to write a letter by Miss Marsh or Miss Duffin to Anne to apologize to her for her behavior. And she does that. And then she is sort of taken out of the asylum again. And then she obviously just is enraged once more by her treatment. And then, you know, the whole thing flares up again. 
It just keeps going down the tubes. It, that's it. That's it. So um, it's a sad yeah, story. It's and, a tragic story. Yeah. It yeah. Is. Mm. And, and certainly um, doesn't speak well of a number of characters here. Because mm. we're so close on time, uh, Carol, I think that yeah. point, I'd like to walk through some of the pages that you've created at this date. Now, so that our viewers know, um, this is a this is a work in process. There are things in here that are going to change over time. Carol's been working on this for a while. Uh, has another project uh, on her boards right now, and then is coming back to this, hopefully to have it published sometime in the next year or so. But let's walk through some of the pages that you've created, if you don't sure. mind, okay. and then we'll go to questions. Okay, so the. The first page. This is just the first page. So I've, I've, this is just four test pieces or test pages, um, and the idea of this. You've seen the C image before, but um, what we have here on the top left is uh, a crow figure, and just underneath that, Eliza herself um, looking out of the asylum window, down at the funeral procession of Anne as she uh, of Anne Lister. And right. so that's uh, little Anne Walker at the top, at the bottom, holding a portrait of um, of Anne Lister, um, and she's saying um, she's saying uh, when Lister, my husband, came back from Russia, it was just as she would have wished, all eyes upon her, her coffin packed by the ice houses of Europe. And then I wanted to have this kind of double voice, so the crow speaks, and the crow is effectively in my. In my conceit, it is uh, the sort of spirit of Anne Lister. Yes, yeah, I love that. So it's a kind of retrospective, a flashback, and then we go into flashback. So right. we could have the next slide. So there's the flashback where um, the the top left image is the two girls arriving. Um, so they've come through this this sort of the perilous journey, uh, and that journey, by the way, the sea journey that you saw on the previous slide. Um, was very perilous because uh, this was before the Suez Canal happened. So ships would go down, and I mean, I think the seas themselves were treacherous. But um, right. the the were the ships were often attacked by pirates and by uh, British ships who had to go in convoy, and they were attacked by French forces as well. And the actual landing at Madras was uh, apparently dreadful. You know, the huge breakers that you had to get through. There were no jetties; you just had to kind of go on little rafts and things. So. <laughs> Wow. All very frightening. Um, yeah, so back to this. So they are, they arrive in York at Manor School. Uh, they, there she goes into the attic. Um, and I've got the crow remembering her. She was so lost. Uh, and then on the left hand, and then they are, there they are in the attic with a bit of cross writing. This is the kind of technique of well, to save paper, writing first horizontally and then vertically across your paper. Um, and that's actually the the text I've used there is from Milton's poem Il Penseroso, which uh, they refer to. Anyway, and there there is the crow and a little kind of erotic moment between them. Yeah. And then and then we have the the moment when she Anne says, "Yes, I'll live with you in ten years' time." Ten years' time, um, right? <laughs> and then uh, ten years, I said, but she had already gone to Bath yeah, with is... Elkins, etc. This was the uh, 19th century uh, way of um, saying, I just need to sow my wild oats, oats dear, and then I'll <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not you, it's me. That's what yeah, yeah, yeah. right. It's not you, it's <laughs> me. <laughs> Moving <laughs> along. <laughs> Moving along. Then we get to the, the kind of, I don't know which story is more tragic, but just yeah. I, I wanted to interleave the story of Jane that I've been talking about today. And yeah. so the, this this little, um, yeah, the, this this is the uniform of Henry Bolton that you saw me making in that video at the beginning. Yeah. And um, and just a little kind of summary about her being, uh, you know, thrown into the workhouse at Portsmouth and so on. Yeah. Um, and then this is this leads to the breakdown. But the, the thing I have put in here is this little crow actually is picking up a key at this point. So this will yes. come in later. So something must be done. I said something must be done. They said, so they put me in Dr. Belcom's asylum. Inevitably, I'm condensing and leaving out a million things there, but you know, I hope you will forgive me that. Start, yeah. The images yeah, are right. just the images are spectacular, Carol. I mean, that one, the cross writ with desire of the two of them up in the attic, and uh, you know, the it's just beautiful <laughs> Thank work. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the technique, just to very briefly say, that is, um, 
what I did was I, I don't none of those in, images now exist apart from the one you maybe can see behind me um, of Anne Lister on my there that way on yeah. my my drawing table there yeah. um, and that's actually on a that's the only one I kept but um, I you I made all of the others on that single sheet of acetate the plastic wow. the printing ink where where I all I did was as you saw in that video not as quickly as as obviously I was doing it there um, I would wipe on the image move the ink around just get incredibly messy make an image take photos of it and then destroy it and and out of that destroyed when I would kind of wipe it across I'd think of some other image that would just come to mind and I'd sort of make that so I did it really I was trying to make stuff very quickly but also because I wanted to talk about um this idea of layering and history and the kind of mystery of it and yes. it's sort of like palimpsest you know we we get glimpses and then they vanish again yes and we're not really certain so that's kind of thematically where I am visually what I want to do with this work well by the I, way I just have to say yeah. I, it won't be published next year I just have to you know yeah. I'm so sorry but um okay. it may it may be some time yet because I've got this other big uh, project a book for Jonathan Cape a graphic novel called The Russian Detective which I'm making and actually I'll still be working on that and through into next year so but this one is is the next one that's after great that. that's in the pipeline so, well, I, yeah. I, I hope that when you finish it, you'll come back and uh, and uh, and let us see the end result because oh, I'm I'm glad to see what you do with us. Uh, <laughs> so I'd love let, to. let's uh, let's take some questions. Okay. And if you'll hold on a second, uh, we're without Cheryl today, who's got mm -hmm. some things going on. So I have to I have to find the questions in a different place. Of course. Uh, this question is from Beth Donald. Eliza Rain was the brains behind Anne's script hand, but Anne made changes after Eliza was out of the picture. Is this correct? Talking oh, about code, evidently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yes, as I said. Um, thanks for the question. I think I think that's a great question. Yes, I I I um, absolutely. I think that's that's the case that Anne developed it. Um, I, I think we know that it came. The original idea came from uh, Eliza, or you know, was sparked from yeah. their encounter in some way. But um, clearly, it was something that Anne developed, and and the kind of the particular combination of letters and Greek letters and so forth that um, that Anne used. I I have no knowledge of whether that was the sort of code that was used in the Anglo Mysore Wars that I was talking about. Right. Um, so that that connection is, as I said, is a speculative one myself. But yeah, that, that's right. Right. Um, let me see here. Okay. I think, you know, our problem is, is that we've really, we've really run out of time. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And that happened. Okay. Uh, let me just check one other thing here. Hold on. Uh, how long will it take you as I'm doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about the actually finishing this project, how, mm -hmm. how much time will you put into this by the time you're done? Oh, well, I've already put in, I'd say, a considerable amount of time uh, <laughs> researching in a, in a way that was completely unexpected for me. I think I just got completely absorbed by this, as I gather everybody does, kind of. You yes. Know, you, you put exactly. your toe in the world of Anne Lister, and before you know it, you're in the in the whirlwind, aren't you? Right. Um, so I think I've spent at least six months on this already in terms of just doing the background research. When I come to do the artwork, I imagine that will take me 10 months. Okay. okay. Well, yeah. So it's a full, it's a, you know, it's a big job. I mean, I would like to make this a substantial piece of work. Yes. And as I say, I've actually got, um, so the publisher, Jonathan Cape, has an option on my next graphic novel. So I'm hoping that, that they might pick this up. I mean, you know, I shouldn't speak too soon. Um, but that that would be that would be the ideal outcome. Yeah, great. That's great. Mm -hmm. And um, to anybody who possibly had a question, and again, we apologize for today because we're actually the two people who generally feed me my time and the questions. Uh, we have some situations going on with each one of them. So if you do still have a question, please just post it on the Facebook site. And I can pass them on to Carol and see if we can get some answers for you. So uh, much appreciated. Um, Carol, thank you. I, I can't tell you how excited I am about this work. And, and I really look forward to seeing what you create out of it. And P.S., 
as a writer myself, I'd love to just sit around and talk about plot points and conflict well, and drama and all the rest <laughs> of that at some point if you're interested. I'll, I'll be coming, I'll be coming to you, Pat, for ideas, definitely. <laughs> I love that stuff. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been yes. a pleasure to thank you. And uh, we're gonna let you go now. And um I want to thank all of you for tuning in once again, as usual. Uh, I also want to thank my team today. As always, the inimitable Steph Galloway, um, uh, Cat Williams, is who is on vacation but managed to take this from someplace else, and my fabulous wife, Brenda, who's feeding me the times today. So, uh, so thanks to all the team. Also want to remind everybody about this little thing called Ann Lister Birthday Week that we're going to be throwing a little party, April 2 through 9, uh, 2022. And I have to tell you, we are um, we are really excited about the schedule that we're going to be uh, sending your way. There's so much that we've got going on. Um, it's just going to be a blast. History, mystery, discovery, and most importantly, community, because all of this that we've been doing over the last almost two years now on Facebook, on ALBW Live, um, the Pack with Potential Summits, all of it uh, has all been done virtually. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to get everybody in one space just to celebrate the community that we have. Um, last but not least, I do also want to tell you that we have another ALBW Live coming up on August 7th. I am very excited about this one. Um, Jane Finn, the curate from Halifax Minster, is going to be joining us. We're going to be talking about the way of the sets, which is the path that goes from Halifax up to uh, Shibden Hall and back. But more specifically, we're going to be talking about Anne Lister and her feelings about God, spirituality, and what that means to us in this day and age as LGBTQ, as a part of the LGBTQ community and how we feel about how we relate to some of those bigger issues in our life. So I hope you'll let you join me with that because as I said, I'm really looking forward to it. And in the meantime, I do know restrictions have been lifted, but I hope you'll join me in continuing to wear your mask when you are in situations where you're in close contact with other people. It doesn't take much to wear and it may keep you safe. So, cause I wanna see you in Halifax. All right, thanks so much. Signing off.